Yeah, yeah, yeah. Episode 37 with the one and only Ivor Cummins, Fat Emperor. And we talk about the effectiveness of lockdowns in the context of COVID-19. Let's throw down. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Quadro Caramante. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost-effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening. We're on episode 37 with Ivor Cummins. You guys are going to love this. Straight up love this episode. And this was really inspired by the level of anxiety we were seeing because restrictions were starting to be lifted. And so we wanted to take a better dive into say, like, are we going to be harmed by this? And so we sought out Ivor to help with the question on top of social distancing, wearing masks and, and being responsible. Is there evidence that lockdown is adding value? Are we getting that much more effectiveness from lockdown. And I was surprised to see the answers that we got from Ivor. And I saw this on, on other podcasts and other experts comment to this on, on social media. And so I thought it was a great idea to dive into it and really help us reduce that, that level of anxiety about lifting some of these restrictions. And, and to be absolutely clear, us on the show, we advocate that we continue to listen to our public health officials. They're the experts. We're no, we're not the experts. We're just presenting information as an attempt to be as balanced as possible. The other reason we wanted to do this show is, you know, we talk about a second wave happening in the fall or, or early winter. And we just want to approach this with the best evidence put forward and have the best approach to avoid the negative consequences of lockdown if possible. Like we talked about. The child maltreatment, domestic violence, the economy in general, increased mental illness, delayed diagnoses, um, delayed treatment for cancer patients and those that have other uh, chronic diseases. So, yeah, we just we just want to have a sound approach when it comes to all this. A couple housekeeping things. We got our mega episode coming June 1st. We got Brian Goldman. We got Jane Philpott. We got Andre Picard on a live cast talking about lessons from COVID. 7 p.m. We'll be able to live stream that. It's going to be epic. Stay tuned for that. I want to give a quick shout out to my boy, Dr. Dennis Kim. He's got a new podcast, Trauma ICU Rounds. I love it. High quality, concise, clinically relevant educational content on what you need to know to be a better clinician in terms of ICU material. I love it. Keep throwing down, my friend. Appreciate your uh, hard work. Okay, our guest, Ivor Cummins. He's a biochemical engineer who's really, his expertise is in complex problem solving. He had a refocus in 2012, looking at root causes of chronic illness. You'll see his material on the Fat Emperor on how ketogenic diet and low-carb diets have really revolutionized his life and many, many others. He's got a new movie out called Extra Time Movie. We'll have links to the show notes. Super excited for you guys to hear Ivor throw down. So without further ado, Ivor Cummins. Quadcast Nation. I got the one and only Ivor Cummins on the show and aka the Fat Emperor. And I'm so excited because I'll just tell you a quick story. So Tanya, one of our team members, put me on to, to Ivor and I heard him on an, uh, another podcast. And since then, I've just been eating up his material. So I am so, it feels like a real privilege and I feel like I'm in front of a, a star here, but uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks, Quadjo. And no, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and it's great to have an opportunity to get out to a new audience and, you know, hopefully help them understand some of this crazy stuff at the moment. A hundred percent. So why don't we begin with you? Like I have 
yet to interview someone with no real medical background, but you seem to have this uncanny ability to dissect and and solve problems. So just in your own words, like what is your, what's your background, your education and what you do now? Right. Well, yeah, I'll try and keep it tight, but I was a biochemical engineer originally. I graduated from university in Dublin in 1990. And then I did around 30 years of corporate leadership, really. So leading large teams and complex problem solving across the world. And also as a manager of technical teams that were also involved in development and problem solving. And I worked in dialysis manufacture and development and stent fabrication. So I was connected to the kind of medical bio thing to a point. But to be honest, I didn't really use my biochemical biochemistry background much in my career. And very simply, in 2012, I got adverse blood test results, standard blood tests. A serum ferritin and serum GGT or gamma GT were really high. My cholesterol was high. And I just knew from my technical problem-solving leadership career that these numbers are crazy high. And the doctor didn't seem too worried. So I, I aggressively questioned uh, the two questions you ask anyone when you are brought in to lead a technical problem and root cause it. And the questions are, well, A, what are the implications of crazy numbers? And B, what are the root causes that would cause these to be high, i.e., how do you uh, solve the problem of these uh, high readings? And I got no joy. I went to another senior doctor and then to a professor of medicine who was in the family. And I couldn't really get answers. And I realized then there's something huge if the standard blood tests by these guys I know are good, that they can't answer my questions. There's something missing here. And I went to PubMed and ResearchGate. I had corporate logons and I said, right, I'll root cause it. And within a few weeks of intense, obsessive work, nights and weekends, I had the solution. It was carbohydrate metabolism. And there was almost no doubt in my mind. To give an example, one night I came running out of my living room shouting, and my wife couldn't understand my obsession, but I said, I've got it. And the reason I knew I'd got it is because my research had shown that serum ferritin must be a sixth marker for the metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance syndrome. And I knew that, but I had no proof of it, but that had to be true. And then I found a Chinese paper, 2010, and it actually was titled that, would you believe, that serum ferritin should be the sixth marker for the metabolic or cardiometabolic or insulin resistance syndrome. And I, I just knew that and many other moments, I knew I had it. So I went on a low-carb diet immediately. I began to realize I could eat fatty meat safely again because all that fat stuff was junk science. And psychologically, it was hard. As I ate them, I felt I, I was probably going to damage myself because my whole life I'd been indoctrinated. But I got over that. I lost American units 32 pounds in around nine weeks. My blood tests after nine weeks, I went back in, they were perfect. And I now knew something huge, which I thought I'd discovered. But then I discovered there's a low carb movement. I, I didn't know that. I thought I'd discovered some magical truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so I started lecturing hundreds of engineers in my corporation, put them on YouTube for fun or well, to help people maybe. And then I got a big following very fast. So now I have probably hundreds of doctors and even professors, researchers around the world in my direct network, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Wow. No, I, I, we're going to dive more into some of the low carb benefits because it ties in nice to the, the COVID talk we're talking about. But uh, wh where did the fascination for COVID come in? Because once again, when I heard you on the podcast talking about, you know, the benefit, the lack of benefits of lockdown versus social isolation, I, uh, I mean, you had my ear and uh, I'm just still fascinated on what, what got you there? Like, how did you, like, why did you start to evaluate that? Yeah, it's kind of a funny thing. One, one thing, one reason I began to focus on Corona is because when it blew up late in March, I realized that my usual message about low carb and insulin resistance and the coronary calcium scan, the CT scan of the heart, the CAC score, 
that's always been my message to help people. But I realized that the whole world was so focused on this thing now that I'm not really going to get much traction there. And I realized I'm going to have to kind of root cause Corona and produce material to help people understand it because that's what people are looking for. So there was kind of a practical reality. So, and also I was fascinated because now we have a similar scenario. I'm looking at the data even from China and then Italy, and I'm seeing the curves go up and down in a cycle that's not really affected by the lockdown. I'm, I'm seeing the ore values of spread coming right down towards one, and then they put a lockdown in, and then it sits at one or a little bit below. And I'm thinking, what's with this lockdown stuff? And I looked up some papers around the history, and there's a good published paper. I can send it and link it uh, maybe afterwards. 2006, a team from the bioterrorism, you know, an official team published a study. And they went through in great detail why it is the wrong thing in a flu epidemic to try and lock down people and try and co coalesce them together. And I got that way back. And then I saw what was happening in the world. Everyone went lockdown crazy. And I thought, hold on a minute. Social distancing, hands, you know, surfaces, and maybe masks, a lot of data for them, it seems. They all make sense and they keep our personal freedoms and society and economy running, which is very important to me, not because I'm a money guy, but because I know that's what gives societal health. Economies are important, these jobs. So that, so that was one thing. But I kind of thought, what are they doing? And none of the math made sense. And even the Italian experience that scared the hell out of them and caused them to trigger lockdowns. The Italian data, quite clearly, I talked to buddies, math buddies at the time. It was already going through a cycle. And I figured this is another flu-like illness, pretty severe. It's going to hit the old. We knew from China, hypertensive, aged, and all those kinds of people in heart disease and insulin-resistant people. I know it's tough. Every death is tough. But, you know, it's not like it's going to hit the young like 1918 or 1957 flu. I mean, everything's relative. So why aren't they distancing? to protect the ICU and the hospitals, which is what they're saying. But what's with this lockdown? And all these laws started coming out. You can't go two kilometers from your house. And I said, okay, that's absurd. They were going up and arresting people almost up the mountain cycling. But I knew from a Chinese paper that only one in 325 people tracked incredibly well back to the source. Only one in 325 caught it outdoors, and even that case was ambiguous. So it made no sense to stop people going out or traveling. You know, and I could go on, but just it, this was like a nightmare for me in March and April unrolling. And I just said, what are they doing? And then as I got into it more and more, and as you mentioned earlier, I had the Nobel Prize winning scientist, Professor Michael Levitt uh, from Stanford, who's been saying this since February also, and I had him on my show, and we went through it. And, and, and we have, just so people know, is it just Michael? Is it just me? Is it just all my math buddies? No. Professor uh, Isaac Ben Israel published three, four weeks ago that mathematically, when you look at all the European countries and analyze it, the virus follows a curve effectively independent of lockdowns. And we had the Woods Hole Institute published three weeks ago. Europe there is a strong possibility not a single life was saved by the lockdowns and many will be lost, did the analysis. And there's one more, Professor Carol Hennigan, get this, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University, UK. And he, four weeks ago, was in a newspaper, the media didn't like it, but one newspaper covered it, and his team published and said the lockdowns in the UK did not affect the reduction in spread. The peak of infection and death happened before the lockdown. If anything, social distancing slowed the curve, but the lockdown didn't. So we have the whole world now locking down people, infringing on freedoms, and the mathematics from four professors, at least, if not many more, says that the lockdowns did almost nothing. But our freedoms are being thrown in the bin. The people are terrified. What is, what is this about? That's a question. And the last thing I'll say is just a killer. Countries all over the world, Slovenia, Czech Republic, 
with virus still in their societies at the level same as when they actually started lockdown, are unlocking. You know what's happening? The rates are going right down along the viral cycle, ignoring the fact the lockdown was there or not there. Georgia recently dumped the lockdown and the rates are going down without a blip. The lockdown cannot have helped if taking out the lockdown when you've still got virus all over your community does absolutely nothing. It cannot. Sorry, that was a rant. I don't know. Uh, no, no, it's good. it is good. There's uh, so much I got, uh, so many questions I have. So, and like I'm four years old. Just to, you know, when you say there's you know lack of evidence that lockdown works. So certainly, I, I understand the argument that you know you you get rid of lockdown and you're not and you're not seeing a, a, an uplift of rise of rise of cases. That that I could I could understand. Help me understand how these, you know, Nobel winning authors, like how do, how do they determine this? Like, how do you determine that lockdown is ineffective? Right. And that's where you need the data and the data started coming out. So Professor Levitt, who's uh, the Nobel winner actually in science 2013 for complex chemical uh, reaction progression modeling. So he, he's a good guy to have on this. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> he saw the China data. He was in China at the time, and then he was traveling back to the U.S. And he noticed, was one of the first to notice, that the epidemic was not going up exponentially and would never go up like the modeling that scared the governments. And he realized this is never going to go up because it was never really exponential. And the virus starts off with an R value around three. So one person infects three. And it grows fast. But what he saw was that without measures, it was already slowing down to 2.6 and 2.2 by going through the data. And he realized that mm. the lockdowns are not syncing up. And the Italian data he went through, like a friend of mine did and I did, and the Italian data spiked up to a high R of three or four. That's when you have a naive population and the first infected people Everyone around them is just begging to be infected. So you got a three. Mm -hmm. But then after just a couple of weeks, as it spreads, there's fewer and fewer people to be infected. And just the whole tempo changes, like all viruses. And it begins to slow down to 2.2 and 1.8. And maybe the distancing here helps slow it down. That's fair. But in the Koch Institute analysis for the German government, they clearly show that the R value, so three is spreading, you want to get it down to one, right? Mm -hmm. The R value was down pretty much at one by the time they put in the lock down, and it stayed mm -hmm. roughly at one afterwards. And Ireland, similar stuff, the lockdown went in, the R value was already down just from distancing and from the natural viral cycle and immunity building mm -hmm. up in more and more people. So mm. many, many countries now, that, and that's why these Professor Amat from Israel and elsewhere can say this because on Woods Hole Institute, it's not hard. The R value data is there and you can see that it was coming right down before the lockdowns in many countries. And when the lockdown came in at that date, the R kind of stayed the same. The curve didn't shift with the lockdown. So interesting. Yeah. So I think by March in Europe and the US, you had so much prevalence of this around the place. And remember, the mm. antibody tests won't see it. And there were no antibody tests then. The antibody test is going to miss a lot of people who were infected, who fought it off with their innate immune system. They won't leave antibodies. So they're still undercounting. You think so? Yeah. So, you, so like you, you don't think they'll have a IG. IgM. I, I, this is the first I've heard that uh, ever. Yeah, it's being like, debated at the moment, but okay. there is a lot. There's a paper out on t killer T cells where they've demonstrated you can get a reaction where the virus is attacked without leaving the antibodies. Now, we don't know what percentage, okay. but it appears younger, healthier people who bat it off without even noticing anything will tend to be the people mm -hmm. where you won't pick up something in the test. And that's important because you could have 20% who effectively it had passed by them, 
and you only get 6% in your antibody tests, and you say, oh, only 6%. But the reality is 20% have, been, have passed this. And 20% for coronavirus late in its cycle, where we are now in Europe, is a very good effective herd immunity. It's just going to rapidly speed the decline. So we need to watch the rest of the cycle in Europe in the coming weeks and the US. But Georgia is a good example. Drop the lockdown and the curve keeps shooting down. You know? Wow. Wow. <laughs> this is... So is there... In your mind, is there any place for lockdown? Like, like say, for example, if, it, if we did it early, but I'm just thinking out loud here, but knowing how infectious this seems to be or how contagious, I should say, mm. uh, is, do you, did you, like in your opinion, do you see any value for lockdown at any point? Well, right now, as I described, mathematically, it would appear very little value. And if you, if you factor in the societal cost of lockdown, not to mention undermining our freedoms and also showing governments how the people can get so terrified so easily, they're going to sign off every freedom that you ask for. Mm. That's just very dangerous. And of course, we talked earlier about the cancer people who are undiagnosed and heart disease problems and the hospital's empty now. So lockdown could cause way more deaths than we had, and it may not have really saved hardly any. Is there a place for lockdown? Well, if you've got a highly uh, dangerous disease, that's really got, instead of currently in Europe, it's looking, and America, that when this passes over into the summer and it's heading down, it looks like around 0.06% of the population will have sadly died. 0.06. That's the effective impact. And that's with the lockdowns being taken away. So you can't credit the lockdown with a lower rate because you took them all away when the virus was still there and they still headed down. So 0.06%. Now, if you had a much more severe disease that was hitting all ages indiscriminately at a higher percentage, maybe it'd be so urgent that you'd have to just do a lockdown anyway in desperation. Or if you're really early and you know a highly virulent, dangerous disease, there's just a few people have got into the east side of your country and you lock down that zone and start tracking and tracing and grabbing every person. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there you can actually contain it. But to be quite honest, a flu-like virus that came into Europe, we knew in January, and was unconstrained for two whole months with a high R value, and then you lock down? Na, 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 na. Mm. And that's why I think in New York, <laughs> you see, well, I mean, it's logic. So you see uh, Governor Cuomo in New York was astonished last week because they've had a hard lockdown and 66% of the new cases, right, way post lockdown, were people who had stayed locked down. They interviewed them. They had stayed at home. But you see, the lockdown was too late. In March, mm. I'd say New York was hyper spreading in the subways. And by the time they locked down, when the, when the people started dying, it's way too late to lock down. They would have had to, in February, be doing very powerful social distancing. And they weren't. So wow. the irony is here, I think, what drives the politicians and the experts to lose their nerve is when you start seeing people dying in amounts. And that mm. precisely, by definition nearly, is too late to really benefit from a lockdown. You, you know? Wow. It seems yeah, to be... So <clears throat> Wow, Ivor. Like, uh, so basically, clear signs that there was for it to have been effective. If it would have been effective, we might, would have had to have done it much earlier than we had. Because I mean, this is such an important conversation. For, you, like you alluded to, to it before. Like, yeah, there is so many deter like negative consequences of a lockdown, and we. My one part of our mission on the show was just to talk about it so we could do something about it. So, you know, we talked about these, the cancer screening, but like the child abuse, the domestic abuse, the alcoholism, overdoses, people presenting late to hospital right now because of uh, their fear of coming in. Like it is just so much stuff. And, and I, I'm also thinking too about 
some of even, you know, a normal elective procedures at this point. You got a, you've had a, a bad hip, a bad knee. Like I have no idea when that's going to be addressed in your life. And it's, it's, so these conversations I think are so important, especially if we get the second wave in the fall, like really having a strategic approach on how we should be approaching this, man. And I don't even know what it is. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And, and like you, you could switch as well as what, what could they have done that made sense? That was driving me crazy in March. Well, okay. We know that all coronaviruses in history for what it's worth and the influenzas and all these families, they're powerfully seasonal. So mm-hmm. we know that if we could somehow simulate summer, it might really help save lives. I'm not saying it'd be easy. But we know what summer does. UV light availability is very hard on the virus and surfaces and everywhere else. So, you know, we have UV light technology. We know that vitamin D is depleted later in the winter. And that's where you always get flu and coronavirus explosions. And then they resolve themselves coming into the summer. So there's a lot of that science that's there and available, but no one's interested because they became obsessed with lockdowns. So I was just talking Hmm. to someone earlier today and they said, well, what about coming into next winter? And it won't be early in the fall because vitamin D doesn't fall away and, and the sun loses its power until maybe a little later, maybe November. That's, that's the rain problem. What if we're going to get a bit of a second wave? Well, there's a couple of things. Many of the susceptible sadly have died. So the second wave, unless there's a mutation or something, but there's nothing you can do about that. The vaccine won't help with that anyway. So, you know. Mm-hmm. If it's just a second wave of the same virus, it'll be less pronounced because the people who are susceptible, sadly, you know, have been taken out to an extent. But the other thing is we've seen recently from vitamin D studies, three or four human studies, India, Philippines, and a USA one, and Indonesia. And they all say the same thing. If you're above 30 nanograms per mil, which means you are healthy, you've eaten a good diet, you've gotten a healthy son. Above 30 nanograms per mil, you're 10 times less likely to die or have serious outcomes from COVID. And this is three studies. Now it's associational, but why wouldn't we do all the things that will make someone join that greater than 30 nanogram evolutionary human D-level group? It's not just supplements. Mm -hmm. Supplements might bring up your number, but they might not necessarily give the magic. Because healthy sun gives you nitric oxide and many other photo products. And being insulin sensitive makes your D status go up, even if you don't take mm. supplements or eat D rich foods, because it's a marker for metabolic syndrome. So imagine you had a strategy to say, wow, before let's w- next winter, let's get everyone that we can like it was the summer and low mm. insulin resistance, high vitamin D status robust immune systems. We've got six months to do that. We could save so many lives. But I think, wow, who's going to do that? No one. Because it's a terrible thing to say, but I'll I'll have to say it. No one really cares about what I just said. They either don't know about it, or there's no patent. uh, There's no magic med. There's no easy solution. That stuff is hard. Whatever reason. Quadro, but no one cares. This is why you're here. Yeah. This is why we're having this conversation, my friend, because I this is something that has stuck with me for a week and it's been it's just been eating at me. Cause mm. I like I said to you before, I, I'm in the ICU. I see the patients that are coming in sick. And this talk of obesity, hypertension, diabetics is real. Like the, the most of these patients have these characteristics, and it's well documented in the literature to support that. Yeah. If we could absolutely change the narrative and say, hey, guys, take the power back. Do what you can do to get healthier. Get some sun. Get that uh, insulin resistance down. Get your your waist circumference down. Fix that metabolic profile and see what happens. And regardless, even if we're wrong, like in terms like just like hypothetically speaking, being healthier, feeling good, having a better mindset like these are these aren't bad things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And- absolutely, Quadro. And, you know, the other thing is, even if Corona was as bad next winter, which is unlikely unless there's some kind of mutation, 
doing what you're describing or I'm describing is going to save way more lives than you're going to lose from Corona next winter, even if Corona inexplicably still has the same death toll. The interventions mm. you're talking about across America are going to save vastly more lives over a year than Corona can ever take next winter. Mm. So you're going to be massively ahead of the game. But of course, what they'll do is they'll drastically reduce the Corona deaths also if they are in the offing or if they are going to happen. You're going to have way fewer, way fewer. Wow. Mm. No, it's, it's a, it's, it would be, like I said, it would be such an amazing narrative to be able to, to bust this up. But I mean, I think this is what we got to do. I think this is what we got to do in terms of, you know, I think number one, I've, I've been hearing way more people questioning, you know, our general approach to, to COVID-19 and, you know, the lockdowns and so forth, like the duration, especially the duration. I was, I personally wasn't like the, the fact that we did it, I think was like, I think it was reasonable just knowing, not knowing what we're dealing with. Right. But it's been the, the duration that's bothered me. The, the fact that uh, we've been slow to reintegrate and, and for example, you know, still waiting to do elective surgeries. This is May 22nd. Like, like things are just, it's slow. And so I think realistically, people need to think about what's at stake. And there's a lot at stake. And so, you know, and people, you hear it more and more, healthcare providers, common folk, engineers saying like, what are we doing? Is this the right, are we approaching this the right way? Yeah. And, and, I'd, I'd agree with you, Gradio, as well, because originally, even though I knew what I knew back around March, I'm not sure I would have put my money where my mouth was then for sure. There was still doubt. Mm -hmm. So you know what? When the lockdown came in in Ireland, I thought, look, that's almost certainly not going to help. But you know what? When you're heading into a period where your ICUs are going to get heavily loaded, it's no harm belt and bracing this and maybe even further slowing the curve in case you have a real bad situation and some people don't get the care they deserve. But after a couple of weeks, you could see that the curve was going where I expected and it was coming back down again. And the average age of death in Ireland was 82. And many of the people never got to ICU because 60% of the deaths were in care homes. I think a lot of them actually just passed away in the care home. So I'm looking mm -hmm. average age, 80 something median, 83 or four, you know, Medical dish of a vast majority, and the mm. ICU is not overloaded, and there was an extra hospital or two made, and they were never used. So after mm. a couple of weeks, you were saying, okay, the lockdown's over now. But no. In fact, four or five weeks later in Ireland now, they are still on the radio, the leadership, saying that nearly no one is immune, which is absurd, because it was all across Ireland in March and April. It was all over the place. They're saying no one's immune and they've got a four month plan to phase out the lockdown, which is insane. Four months. Yeah. Or three months maybe at this stage, wow. but I'm looking and thinking, okay, okay. You did a lockdown that wasn't really helping, but I understand. Now, what are you thinking? This, this is, hmm. this is insane. And I, I give an example of Israel. So Isaac Ben Israel, the mathematics professor who's from Israel, produced the paper four weeks ago and said the lockdowns didn't really save any lives. I can't explain the virology, but I can tell you mathematically what I described earlier. The curve had mm -hmm. turned and these things burned themselves out like previous viruses, independent of the lockdown dates, right? But I can't mm -hmm. tell you the virology. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. Fair enough. The math. Yeah, it's the math. I can't argue with math, the highest science. So, he must have been brought in to the, or the Isra or Israeli prime minister because a week or two after that report, two weeks ago, Israel astonishingly had the hardest lockdown in the world almost, and they dropped it on a Monday. They said, okay, the limit of 200 meters is gone. You can go wherever you want. We're opening up all businesses except gyms and swimming pools. We're going to hold off a week. Otherwise, get back mm -hmm. to work. And kids, you can visit your grandparents again. You can, I said, what? The grandparents are the ones at risk, but they're saying you can, you can visit your grandparents again. In other words, the lockdown's gone. And Israel, in the last two weeks, the curves kept going exactly as they were. 
And in fact, yesterday, there was a 5,000 person jam packed beach concert with music for hours in Israel. I put the video out on Twitter and the police are on the edges and they let it all go ahead. What? Yeah. Even even the, even the mass uh, gatherings. I mean, it was outside, but still. Well, they wagged a finger, but I'm talking rock concert. People are embracing, kissing, and they're all against each other in a huge crowd with pounding music. And the police said, oh, you're not really meant to do these big crowds. But clearly the message from the top was, yeah, yeah, let it go. And how long ago, Ivor, you said where they, we, when this happened, when they stopped the restrictions or stopped the lockdown? I think it was Mon- Monday two weeks ago. It's two weeks ago okay. approximately or possibly two and a half. But may- maybe it's only, okay. maybe it's only uh, two weeks ago. But to be honest, I know you say there's a lag time, but we know from Slovenia and Czech Republic and many others mid-April were, were pretty much backing off and their tube trains were filling up again. We know from all the other mm. countries who've done it a lot longer ago, the curve keeps going down. The curve don't care. Pretty wow. much. And it, wow. And so in terms of explaining, I don't know if this is a fair question for you, but ex- explaining why uh, the the curve continues to go down. Like, is this mostly, you, you feel like is it seasonal or it's the herd immunity issue? Like, what? what I, I mean... Yeah, that might be a tough question. Sorry, but it, what do you think? It's a good one to talk about. But yeah, it is a tough question to go on the record in ways, but it's good to talk about it. So I'd say a big factor in most places is this uh, word that was always accepted as a concept. But a few weeks ago, it suddenly became a dirty word. Herd immunity. Herd immunity is a fundamental concept. I was talking to a virologist, an extremely impressive German guy. And he said, look, coronaviruses, once you got 20 or 25% of your population exposed, even if only 5% of antibodies, even if a lot of them haven't generated antibodies, but they brushed it off in their mucus linings with their macrophage without even generating, they're effectively immune because they passed it off with no problem. 20, 25%, the virus loses its legs in your society. If you add social distancing measures and some other smart stuff together, you're kind of there, right? The lockdown doesn't really add or take anything. So it's a combination of the virus cycle. It loses its its legs when you get more and more immune and you can't reach the susceptible people. And also when the susceptible people sadly perish, you know, that's part of it. It kind of runs out then as well. You get more and more just Mm -hmm. asymptomatics. So I'd say it's fair to say a combination of social distancing, washing hands, hygiene, and uh, all that kind of stuff, maybe masks as well, you know, smart stuff that doesn't really impact society too much, just like Korea and all those guys have done, the lowest death rates Mm -hmm. in the world. They didn't have to lock down. Uh, A combination of social distancing and the viral cycle of immunity building, even without antibodies in the population is largely seems to be why these things are always shaped the same, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why it's, it's incredible to hear the Irish government today came out and said that less than 1%, right, are immune or exposed. And we're going to have to stay locked down. So there's no second wave in the summer. And we're going to have to wait for like drugs and stuff. And I'm thinking, What's driving this? Because take an example, uh, Quajo, this is an example. So Sweden had whatever it was, 400 deaths per million. And Ireland had around 360 or something with a similar death rate. Sweden Mm -hmm. have verified 8% are immune with antibodies. And their leader, Anders Tegnell, who's leading the whole country's strategy of not locking down, he's indicated what I said that they reckon there's a hell of a lot more. They're going to be hitting the 20s, like later in May. So how could Sweden be, who are on the money and on the science, have a debt rate of 400 per million and be heading to a 20% de facto immune? And Ireland Mm -hmm. has the same debt rate per million, and our government is claiming less than 1%, at the same time that the UK, who has a similar debt per million, higher maybe, 
are now multiple professors are coming out and saying 20 to 30 percent in the UK. Mm. And by the way, London, London went back to work last week. Really? And the tube trains are packed. They are back to work. It is thriving. Right. Maybe I'm, well, maybe I'm not just not watching the news, but I, I just you're not hearing this. No, you're not. Oh, the media not interested. Yeah. The media are only interested how the Swedish government are evil, how herd immunity is not true, and it can't happen. How the latest corner case victim, who sadly was 31, died, and also Kawasaki disease in children, a rare disease that happens actually in outbreaks because of vitamin D deficiency after the winter, right? Papers going back to 1988 about this. And they jumped on Kawasaki disease and, and pinned corona on it. A handful of cases across the whole of Europe, mm-hmm. 600 million people. I was all over the news for two or three days. I had people come back to me, yeah, but Ivor, it's not just the deaths. The children are affected too. And I said, what do you mean? And they sent me a link to an article. I said, that's Kawasaki's disease. And when you read the article, it says down the bottom in small print, we're not necessarily sh- sure it's connected to corona. The whole article mm-hmm. is pure fear porn. I mean, it's unbelievable. Absolutely. The media yeah. lost it. The politicians lost it. They can't seem to get back to sanity. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm, at, I'm at a loss. Well, you, you got to ask yourself, first of all, yeah, the, just because a lot of our listeners have kids, it's like the incidents of Kawasaki's, even if you think there was an association is like small, like it's, it's, that's not even doing it justice. The other point I was going to make is there's a lot of incentive to, for the media to give you negative or like to give the, the bad news. Like it's more ratings. It's, you know, you know, politicians have a lot to lose if they're wrong. Like there's, there's, I think you could explain behaviorally like uh, what what we're seeing, but it's just, but you just wish that a lot of this was driven by data. Like I, I think in general, like as a, even as a clinician, I think we, one of my huge areas of interest is, is bias and, and decision-making. And I can't, can't, can't tell you how many, mm. you know, times I've seen, you know, a management approach based on recency bias or, what time of the day it is or decision fatigue, you know, it's not based on like objective measures. And I was just worried about how much of this is real is based on science is based on the numbers and, and, and full disclosure, Ivor, like there's still a, a, a lot of things we don't know about the disease. Like there was clinically, there was some, some things that were odd. Like uh, when we see how many, how easily they clot, to the way they they act on ventilators is I've never seen before some neurologic uh, abnormalities. So yeah, I, I, there is logic there, but it's I just wish m- more and more this is based on like data, you know. And because like, yeah, there's a, sorry I d- didn't mean to cut you off. There's oh no 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 I agree I agree with everything there. There are some sides to this that are kind of ominous and are very interesting medically. But if you take a bird's eye view, the other problem is we always had an engineering issues is you discover an issue and the engineers get excited and then you begin to see it everywhere and you begin to find new aspects of it and you create Mm -hmm. a a huge amount of little issues. And suddenly you've got a long issues list because you're seeing phenomenon of cracking casings. Now we've noticed there's more cracking casings as well as the electrical failure, which was the first issue. And you're looking and the teams are moving in the spotlight and the microscope's on. You see everything. Now you're seeing Mm -hmm. shit that you didn't even know was there. could have been there two years Mm -hmm. ago. So there's an element, Mm -hmm. too, that the spotlight, the arc light, is so powerful on this. They're seeing every case of Kawasaki's as a scary thing. The Mm -hmm. blood clotting phenomenon. I noticed in New York, in one of the articles, they got in two weeks, I think, four cases of stroke in sub-50 year olds. You know, that's, that's, none of them died. One of them had had a prior stroke. So that's, forget that, right? Years before, a couple of years before. And they were left with three. And then the article was literally terrifying. I'm not joking, Quadjo. It was a terrifying article. And down at the mm. end, there was a quiet little sentence. The specialist uh, noted that 
we usually only see one instance of this every two weeks. So the whole article was about three non-fatal strokes in sub 50 year olds when you should only expect to see one. And that was a, a full page. I mean, that was all over. So yep. the question is, how relevant is it? Of course, it's relevant to the individual who's suffering or whatever. But on the global scheme of what we've done, shut down the world, how relevant is the Kawasaki? How relevant is the fact that, you know, Corona is killing whatever it is, tens of thousands, mostly older, diabetic, leptin resistant, insulin resistant, but also some younger, often with diabetes, maybe low vitamin D. But, but yeah. But, but how big a deal is the blood clotting aspect in the scheme of Corona's impact? It's not really a huge deal. It's unfortunate. But you, you, do you know what I mean? Perspective, I think, has been the first casualty here. Perspective. Mm. What do you think? I, yeah, no, I, I, think, I think it's just, once again, it's all fear. It's like <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you are, what's the term? Like if you're amped up, you're any little deflection that instead of like maybe taking a bird's eye view and saying, okay, maybe there's an association here, or maybe this is, mm. there might be some truth here, but let, let's look at it objectively. All of a sudden, this is big news. This is press. This is like, man, look how scary this bug is. It's yeah. doing so much more than we think it was was uh, going to do. So I, to me, it just, it, it really stems from that, that whole like, uh, f- fear base and so and that anxiety so yeah it's 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 really striking let me i just thought of a question too about in terms of lockdown versus social distancing you know so you you mentioned sweden and often we talk about the numbers like when you look at neighboring countries in terms of you know the amount of deaths that are happening in sweden compared to we'll say finland or norway are you still a believer of you know, like the area under the curve will be the same, like, i.e., like that the deaths may ultimately still be the same, whether, you know, whether the curve is flat or not. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I don't yeah. know if I'm articulating no, you that did. very well. I got it. That That's yeah. a, a nuanced question. And, and mostly people aren't talking about the nuance. So in general, the area under the curve, when you include all of next season and beyond, should end up being roughly the same, except Mm -hmm. if this is seasonal and all coronaviruses in history were and and the influenzas, if you can hold off artificially a certain number of people getting exposed and get to the summer, and then it really is an adverse environment for the virus, you may have kind of saved them for a pretty long term. I mean, it's, it's theoretically possible. And sure, next winter, you're going to have to save them again when it comes back, because we're never going to eliminate it. Swine flu is still out there. So is SARS. So, but they might get an extra lease of time. Now, mostly they'd be elderly people. So if you take uh, Sweden, 50% of their deaths are care homes, institutions. They run really large institutions and they got hit. They admitted Mm -hmm. 50%. Another 25% of the deaths are care at home. So they're people at home who carers are coming to, elderly. Of the remaining 25%, there's a very disproportionate Somali presence in the deaths. Because now you're talking about a far northern latitude and dark-skinned people get profound vitamin D deficiency. You know, And this was seen, I believe, with the draft dodgers from the Vietnam War. A lot of them went to Sweden and they ended up having a rickets problem developing in the black guys who had gone there because after a few years of the northern low uv i mean there was a complete mismatch so you take 50 percent plus 25 percent plus a big chunk of ethnic minority who would have had major d issues now you're explaining a huge chunk of sweden's debts and i believe that denmark has smaller homes they did a better job of protecting them so they got way ahead And Norway is geographically kind of sparse and Finland is very sparse with population density. And also they have different cultural stuff. And also this is tenuous, but Finland a good few years ago began to put in a vitamin D program 
across their population because they were recognizing the deleterious consequences of being far north and vitamin D being a problem. Not sure Sweden did. So I'm only touching on, oh, and Sweden, 50% of the deaths almost are in a single city of a million people, Stockholm, which is a lot of ethnic minorities, uh, to my earlier point. So when you start looking at the geographics, and Sweden's 10 million people are not in the huge country of Sweden. They're massively down in kind of a Denmark-sized country. So they're much more dense than you'd think. So I'm rambling on a bit, but I'm just giving the idea that there's huge differences Massive differences between these countries. And yet, what are the people saying? Sweden's beside that country, and it's got more deaths. <laughs> it, that is not science. And then if you look at all of Europe, Sweden is in the middle of the pack of most countries, way below Belgium mm. and UK and deaths per million. It's, it's beside mm. Ireland in the middle of the pack. Mm. I mean, people are, are to be honest, uh, Quadjo, People are using associational, simple data. We'd kill them for using that data in a normal issue. We will say, that's mm -hmm. only an association. But with this, we somehow accept it. The association between a behavior or an intervention and an outcome between two countries that happen to be beside each other. And you're using that as mm -hmm. a proof. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And the yeah. last thing I'll say, because yeah. I, I just don't want to leave it out, in fairness, Sweden, CNN did a video there, and they are a lot more open than they let on. So Stockholm, where most of the deaths were, there's people shopping, and they're not even doing three feet distancing. They have the video. Mm -hmm. Cafes, people in the streets, no masks. Culturally, they decided no masks. So Sweden, mm -hmm. actually, with that degree of soft distancing, should have more, if you want to use that word. But let's see what happens as it fades in the summer and how different will they really be to the average European country? And it looks like they're not going to be any different than the average European country. Looks like. We'll see. And, and their kids still went to school. Oh, and yeah. We'll see what their economic, what their economy looks like. But holy cow. And a lot to think about. Yeah, for sure. And I put out Sweden's graph with 350 deaths per million. And I put New Jersey with nearly a 1,000 deaths per million. New Jersey locked down hard at the start of the curve. I mean, it was a mm -hmm. super lockdown. Everyone knows that from the media. They have the exact same curve shape as Sweden, only Sweden's is three times less deaths per million. Now, I know they're different, mm. but if you want to do associational compares, I'll do associational compares. Why is New Jersey mm. three times the rate and the exact same shape of rise and fall with with weak distancing versus full lockdown and home arrest. I mean, mm. you know what I mean? None of this obviously makes sense with respect to lockdown. Yeah. There's a, and I mean, this is, I guess, an argument more for the area under the curve uh, analogy. But the, from my understanding too, Sweden never, their ICUs never got like hit hard. Like I know for us, I can speak for, you know, locally, I mean, I think throughout the world, except for, you know, the exceptions of maybe you heard about Washington State and New York and, and, and Italy, but most of the world, I don't think, had overwhelming ICU admissions. I, I, I might be talking out of my ass. There, no, no but, I, um, I think you're right, because I, obviously I'm not experiencing this, but I've, I've, heard, I've been so engaged for many weeks, I've heard New York got really pressed, but in fairness to the staff, and they actually did look after everyone. They still made it, and they did it. Mm -hmm. New York was really tough, and it was tragic. There was no distancing, and the subway cars, I believe, they, they reduced the number of cars, but it just meant they were more full. So right through February and March, they were super spreading, and then when things hit, you know, it was really bad, and it was very sad. But the reality is they managed. Uh, their final death rate after being a city that clearly was riddled and it passed across the city and it's coming down now, their actual death rate will be 0.1 something percent. You know, it, and it will be heavily towards old and comorbidities. Now, not to say that one in a thousand is, is okay, but, you know, if Sweden's 0.06% when this fades in the summer, the way it's looking, New York is maybe one point one something, 
Florida is point oh something really small. But remember, Florida, even though it has a lot of elderly people, it has incredibly low death rates. But they're out on the beaches and they have got massive UV down there. So they're kind of living the summer. And we know coronaviruses don't hit that hard in the summer. New York is far mm. north. It's an absolute disaster zone for vitamin D deficiency post-winter because it's also a city. So a city pollution and far north, that's your worst case scenario. Add in packed subways as you're super spreading before the deaths start. Put it together. Of course, you're going to get double or triple the death rate. I mean, it's not hard to get double or triple with those huge differences between areas. And I don't mean mm. to be callous. Obviously, it's terrible that it's much higher. But technically and scientifically, it's trivial to explain it. But no one in the media is talking about any of the reasons I said. I haven't seen it anywhere, what I said. Wow. So, and like, uh, hmm. no, yeah, and like, I mean, the other, as you mentioned, the population density, like, I, that seems to really be true, a big player, too, right? Like, yeah, you know, because what I've always said, too, was do you have to have the same approach to a city like New York compared to? I'm using a random, I don't even know the density of Cork, but you know what I mean? Like a smaller town where, you know, people are much more spread out. That's a good point. I'm glad you said it because I can't believe I didn't state it amongst the other list. Uh, density, of course, is going to be much more challenging with a respiratory mm. infectious illness. What could New York do? I mean, during February and March, before it took hold, they could have done very strong, well-regulated distancing surfaces, hands. And if you think of Tokyo, Tokyo, very low death rates, and they didn't even lock down through their period where New York was spreading like hell. Tokyo didn't lock down. So there are very dense cities that got away with murder without locking down even, never mind locking down. So, to so Tokyo didn't lock down. Tokyo, oh, sorry, did I miss it? Tokyo did sporadic lockdown type interventions, but right up through the rise in cases, they did not lock down and Tokyo was buzzing. And we know now that through, say, March, where you are building up the problem for tomorrow, like New York did and, and everywhere did, mm -hmm. Tokyo, for a long period of that, just tracked and traced, masked, and kept an eye on things. They didn't lock down. And they, and they effectively got away with it. And there was big news stories about Tokyo was in a state of emergency in Japan. But actually, that was a law they brought in to enable all the local areas to take quick action if it was required. So they didn't actually do an emergency. They put the legislation in place to be able to react with emergency powers as required. So mm. there's a lot of misleading stuff in the, in the media. And like, if you take Australia, New Zealand, Australia, I have it on good authority, didn't do that much for lockdown. And they, mm -hmm. through November, December, and into January, they had hundreds of flights coming from China, where we know it came from. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. And yet they somehow got away with murder, with the lowest cases in the world. Now, I would simply say, well, you can't give me a Southern Hemisphere country that's at the end of its high, hot UV summer and tell me it's low and say that's because of X or an intervention because they've just come out of a summer and no coronavirus has ever spiked in the summer. And we're seeing them all drop now as summer comes in in Northern Europe. It's not proof, but you certainly can't say it was their intervention because I'll put mm. my associational data up against your associational intervention. Mm. Brits. So I, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I didn't, no one's used logic, you know, no one. And Georgia, we come back to Georgia. Georgia's got loads of cases, virus everywhere. They start pulling out the lockdown. The curve doesn't change. How wow. could it not go up? All of the pro lockdown people were screeching. Jason Fung, Dr. Jason Fung told me, that in Georgia, they were all saying, oh my God, it's going to be an apocalypse. And now they're literally standing there scratching their heads and they cannot understand how it's now going to the lowest cases of the whole pandemic. 
the, the cases are wow. down to six, I think, yesterday or something. Come on, this science. Is, I mean, there's, I mean, there was so many questions and uh, that I I had too, and you actually just like answered a lot, <laughs> a lot of them throughout this because one of the questions I've been asking many of my like COVID expert guests and what have you is like, my parents are from Ghana and West Africa, and in my mind, it's highly uh, populated. You know, it's uh, hard to communicate. I mean, a lot of people have cell phones, but, you know, getting the word out about how to be approaching such a pandemic, in my opinion, might be a bit challenging. But you're not hearing it being overwhelmed in a place that's so condensed and low resources. And like, I would think you would see body after body after body if, if, if that was true. But, you know, the UV argument, the seasonal argument... Lack of insulin resistance wow. generally. In yeah, that's areas. true. Yeah. 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 I mean, even you, I would think Australia, New Zealand, same thing. I mean, not to be too, mm. not too generalistic. But, well, on, um, on Cape Town, I was just sent a video yesterday of townlands around Cape Town. And it's utterly business as usual. Throng streets, stalls, stores. There's no real distancing happening in all the townlands. But they're taking people off. Police are off beaches in Cape Town. Now, mm-hmm. it's almost like, it's like, it's like, what is this? Corona apartheid? This is crazy. So they've got mm-hmm. nearly no cases, uh, very few deaths for such a country. And like you say, there's not much happening where there's no lockdown whatsoever and huge numbers of people. No signals emerging. And, mm-hmm. you know, no one seems to care about all of these paradoxes. Now, I, was, I interviewed an Indian vitamin D guy this afternoon, and he had a very interesting study, and they looked at the UV flux all around the world, and then they corrected for local factors like smog, cloud cover, humidity. And at the end, UV alone, when you corrected for the other confounders, which could blur your signal, they got something like a 36% lower rate of death increase for higher UV areas with everything else corrected for and something like a 14% or increase. Now it's associational, but he also showed an amazing graph, which I didn't actually have before. And I'm amazed I didn't. And it showed the Northern hemisphere for fluenza type A. And you could see the huge hump January, February, March, April, because it's seasonal. And then underneath was the Southern hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, And you see nothing from January, February, March, April, May, June, July, but you see the huge hump for their winter. Right. Beautiful. Mm. But in the middle, they put the equatorial regions. And there you don't see the seasonal signal because the UV is kind of fairly steady. But Mm. you see a monsoon signal where the cloud cover blocks the sun. So his worry is, that Ecuador and other regions, when they hit them as monsoon in the next couple of months, they could have a version of our winter and they could get really badly hurt with this virus. Mm. But no one, Mm. and I mean no one, is telling them right now to address insulin resistance and to get as much sun as possible now to ancestrally carry you through the whole season with high vitamin D. You need to act now. And he said, culturally over in these lands, they actually don't want to darken their skin. They want to do the opposite. There's a lot of sunscreen screen use because it's trendy or fashionable to be lighter skinned. So they never run out in the sun when it's warm. The sun's a pain in the ass. They wear light clothing and they cover. They don't want to darker. It's just a cultural thing. So we in Northern Europe and the guys down in Australia, New Zealand, when the first glimmer of sun comes, what happens? America as well. Yes, get out in the sun. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we boost our D through the roof. And then the middle of winter, we're working in offices. There's no sun, not even any light because you're in offices and cities. So now you're evolutionary going really low. That's when it happens. But, but, but I thought it was a sad point that these regions, when their monsoon comes in, they may see a surge and no one's warning them, and there's ways they could avoid that. They could get out now and get really replete in vitamin D, get healthier before it hits. Hmm. Sad, isn't it? 
Wow. Well, I, I'm hoping more conversations can happen like this and more awareness could be brought to the forefront. Because as I mentioned, if something is could be beneficial and mm. have little downside, like let's go, you know? I mean, like, because I, I do wonder sometimes if vitamin D is just a mark. Like, I don't... I don't, I'm not sure if it's just a marker of poor health, like in general, like it's almost like, do you know what I mean? Like you, the way you can measure your ferritin, like it doesn't necessarily mean you're like, it, it just reflects your general health, but, but re- giving it is so benign or getting out in the sun, assuming, you know, you're, you haven't had melanoma or something like I, I think it, you know, I think there's some upside, you know, potential upside, little downside. Well, um, well, yeah. Just like exercise and diet. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, 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 you're absolutely right. Sorry I interrupted you. I, I'm surprised so late in the day I'm so full of energy, but I guess that's low-carbon <laughs> fasting has that effect. <laughs> <laughs> it's got other oh, benefits. Man. But no, I agree totally, and it's a great point to, to emphasize. People hearing this might miss here and think magic D supplements will fix the coronavirus. That's utterly wrong. So I think the best thing is if anyone is interested or disagrees with what I said on latitude, vitamin D, I have a 14 minute podcast number 73 on vitamin D and the studies and explaining that yes, D is a mega marker for metabolic disease. That's one of the reasons and magic supplements are not so magic, but they might help quite a bit Mm -hmm. and they cost nothing, but I describe it and the latitude number 74 around 10 minutes long. I give a lot more detail on the latitude and why Northern Italy got hammered because people might not realize this. Northern Italy has the most profound vitamin D deficiency in all of your. Oh, I heard that too. Yeah. I heard that too. Maybe it was on your show, but I, yeah. I heard that too, that the vitamin D levels in, I wouldn't, yeah, in Northern Italy were, were are low. Maybe that's, that's, yeah. Awful. 86% in one study of people in care homes or institutions were profound D deficiency below 12 and 30 something percent of, I think, postmenopausal women and older were D deficient, hypovitaminosis D. So Italy is, and we, we're going, I know we're wrapping up now, we won't get into the reasons, but it's a reality that vitamin D is tracking because it's a marker and it's a marker of not getting healthy sun exposure, outdoors, good diet, low inflammation, mm-hmm. many, many things. Yeah, I'd agree. But if people want to, mm-hmm. if you link those two, anyone who's curious. We'll absolutely link them. Yeah, they, they can go there because I can't explain it all now. But but they can go there if they if they want to know, if they gots to know. <laughs> if they gots to know, no, they will for, sure, will for sure link that in the show notes. Just because I'm cognizant of your time, I I also want you you maybe to mention like clearly other things that you might suggest in terms of getting healthier. Because I mean, like you said, you're the fat emperor. We talked a lot about vitamin D, but in terms of benefits of low carb, like what's your opinion on that now? Okay, if I in terms now, of COVID, sorry, if I now was an American guy, I was a bit overweight or thin outside, fat inside with a tummy you know, maybe a little bit pre-diabetic, probably low vitamin D anyway, because pre-diabetes, diabetes diabetes drives down your blood, blood status. It's a marker. And, you know, a few other things like that. What would I do now if I knew I was going to be infected with COVID in four or five weeks time? I've got a few weeks now to greatly reduce the impact of the experience, maybe even death, but probably just how severe. What I would do is, okay, I get in a low carb diet really quick, with whole foods, meat, fish, eggs, vegetables, real foods only, drop the ultra processed food, drop the sugar, refined carb, and vegetable oils, which makes up most ultra processed foods, right? Drop those, Mm -hmm. eat real food, low carb, and start fixing my diabetes, which will start fixing from tomorrow. I'm not joking. Within a week, your blood glucose and insulin are going to be right down if you're pre-diabetic. Just doing that Mm -hmm. within days. So I do that. And in four weeks, you're actually going to look you're going to look amazingly better in your bloods in four weeks' time. So that's a great thing. Mm-hmm. I get healthy sun exposure because that's getting possible now. So loads of sun exposure with no burning because you get nitric oxide, good for your arteries, any arterial inflammatory problems like corona gives you, right? The endothelium. Okay. I get lots of nitric oxide from the sun and the vitamin D as well and the other stuff. Healthy sun, no burning, way to go. Magnesium, selenium. 
I would say I'd consider supplementing because they're important and the foods are depleted in them and many people are, are insufficient. And they're both, I would say, from the data, very important for your general health and for your immune system. So it's very easy and cheap as chips to take the maximum recommended daily amount of each of those supplements, as well as now you're eating real foods. So you're going to be getting more nutrition anyway. Fish oil and stuff, yeah, and cut out all the industrial vegetable oils to get your omega-3 index up, which is going to be better immune health and better every health. And if you just did what I just said and you add in exercise, you know, as well, obviously, stress training or in, uh, for, for insulin sensitivity, you know, that's going to supercharge. And if you do a bit of fasting, that's going to supercharge your insulin sensitivity over a few weeks. If you did all those things in four weeks time, I'll tell you, if you magically got a person and split them into two people, one guy did what I said and the other guy did nothing. And in four weeks, they both get the same big sneeze of COVID into their face, right? <laughs> I haven't got the RCT, but I will tell you there will be a dramatic difference in how much they are affected, those two people. I, mm. I mean... And <laughs> I, I, I mean, and like I said, this is good. This is good advice anyway. This is good. Oh, uh, for cancer, for heart and life disease, it, anything. It's the same advice. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I, 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 I can't begin to tell you how much I enjoyed this conversation. Just the, you know, the practical, objective viewpoints using, you know, data to try and, you know, dissect how we should be approaching this. It's so refreshing. I know it's, it's, you know, not a, many people will like what we're saying, but it's, it needs to be said. We need to, we need to be able to have an open dialogue about these things because as we said before, having lockdowns has some serious downstream effects. And I think, you know, oh shit, one thing I forgot to ask you, I should ask you real quick, if you had an opinion on kids going to school, just because like this is hot on a topic in Canada right now. I don't know if you want to, you can skip that question if you want, but. Well, really quickly. Um, so Sweden kept the schools, I think up to 16 or 17 years old and recommended older kids maybe, you know, do remote. I don't think it was obligatory, but they have found that first fact, no single person of all their cases ever got reinfected. So this thing about not being immune and getting reinfected, yeah. that's debunked. So I'll knock that one out of the way. That's, that's fear, fear porn. But on the schools, they also saw in all of their investigations, and there's some others as well, that the children seem to get the mild form low viral load and don't seem to be a significant spread in this phenomenon. Not proven, yeah. but I would say if you're thinking of loosening things up, especially with Georgia and everything else we said about lockdown, if you're thinking of loosening things up, getting the kids back to school is a great first measure to take. And Denmark, which was so much better than Sweden, they put the kids back to school around five weeks ago and they have seen mm. no problem associated with it. In fact, they so they said they're surprised, but delighted. Wow! So that's my uh, schools. The evidence based medicine or science would say that's one of the first things you should do: keep protecting your elderly and diabetic, medical condition people as much as you can. Get the schools back and get this thing cleared out of the population. Wow! No, thank you for that, Ivor. The other things I want to quickly mention before we'll do this in the in the intro and the outro, I'm sure, but. Follow him, the fat emperor, author of Eat Rich, Live Long, Low Carbon and Keto Approach, root cause specialist. What else can I say? New movie out. <clears throat> Excuse me. New movie, the Widowmaker movie. Am I, that well, well, actually, sorry. Do you want to? Yeah, the Widowmaker. If if people if people Google Widowmaker C A C, the two words Widowmaker C A C, they get the free movie that was made years ago. It's great. But our new movie is extratimemovie.com. You just go to oh, extratimemovie.com. It's three ninety nine to to download. And if you could share that, that would really help us keep doing our work. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll put that in the show notes as well. I am so, like, I'm just so glad we had a chance to connect, Ever. And uh, we're definitely doing this again because we're going to dive more into the, into the dietary approach, low-carb, uh, keto approach, and also the uh, calcium score because that's a game changer, my friend.
Great stuff, Gradual. No, I really enjoyed it. And it's, is it Friday? I've lost track of the days. I think it's Friday. I don't even know anymore. (laughs) (laughs) This will come out next week, though. But uh, yeah, this is amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Great stuff. Thanks, Gradual. Anytime. Give me a call. (laughs) Wow, that was so much fun. What a great conversation with Ivor Cummings. I hope you guys enjoyed that. The Fat Emperor. Please leave comments at Quadcast. 99 at gmail.com follow us on twitter instagram facebook at quadcast um props to the social media team the show notes team the research team i love you guys you guys do amazing work sign up for our newsletter there'll be links to the show in the show notes and guys i hope that served us some inspiration let's get healthier like why not let's do the stuff that we can do to improve our chances of combating COVID-19, exercise, eating well, getting sun exposure, getting vitamin D. You know, I think it's I think it's beautiful because we could take that power back, yo. Like there's something we could do instead of just sitting idle. Anyway, that's that's it for me guys. Can't wait to connect soon. Stay safe. <laughs>